Hello, everybody. It is Wednesday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, Assistant Sports Editor for Multimedia at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Back for the Pitching In podcast, special uh, pre-opening day edition with Jason Mackey. We didn't get it in last week because I was uh, I was in March Madness until about 2 a.m. on Thursday, um, Jason. But I'm excited to talk some baseball now that we've got that behind us. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing good, other than being in Miami, but it's not... I'm excited that the season's going to start. Miami is not one of my favorite cities, but uh, yes, the fake baseball is behind us. Let's play the real stuff. I think there are a lot of fun storylines with this team, man. Just can't wait to get going. Absolutely. We're going to get into that in a second here. Before we do, just want to remind you that Pitching In is brought to you, as always, by the North Shore Tavern. If you love baseball, you'll love the North Shore Tavern. The interior is wall-to-wall pirates. There are appetizers, entrees, cocktails, and, of course, steak and seafood on a sizzling lava stone. Open every day. The North Shore Tavern across from PNC Park is Pittsburgh's home for steak on a stone. Um, Jason, let's let's talk a little bit of off-season stuff here, like acquisitions, departures, um, a little bit of that before we get into the forward-looking stuff, because you know, once we're in the baseball, that's what we're going to be talking about every day. Yep. Um, the Athletic came out with their off-season grades. They gave the Pirates a D for the off-season. Jason, do you think that's too harsh? Just right? Not mean enough? How do you look at um, the the Athletics' evaluation of of what the final? Um, you know, now that there will be no more moves between now and opening day, uh, the final tally was for them. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I am philosophically opposed to grading things like this. I, I understand, I, I guess, in, in sports media, we have to. Um, I just like, you know, I, my, my kids don't get a report card on the first day of school. Like, why are we giving a report card before things have happened? So, like, I, I don't know what Rowdy Telez is going to be. Uh, I know what they didn't address, and I think that's fair. So, in that sense, I think it's fair to criticize them for not doing enough about starting pitching. Like they just didn't bring in enough guys. And even if you said like, you know, Eric Lauer is going to turn into something or Domingo Herman, like that was not done with the intent that it was going to fix something. It's as much of a surprise as Jared Jones. So I guess I would give them a C. I can't really argue with a D. I mean, it's the most important thing. It's what they said they were going to do and they haven't done it. And That stinks because, you know, Joe Starkey wrote about this and I thought he hit the nail on the head where you have a bunch of other interesting pieces and things surrounding the Pirates and optimism. And they've done some things that they should get credit for. And they have a a great player in O'Neill Cruz and good supporting pieces and Brian Reynolds, Brian Hayes, Jack Sawinski at all. The starting pitching isn't good enough. You have Bailey Falter in your rotation. So to me, you're going no higher than a C. I just I have a tough time criticizing like. Am I going to say Yasmani Grandal did not work out? Am I going to say Rowdy Telez did not work out? I just don't know that. And and to me, that's what we need to wait and see. And maybe that's the difference between the two. Yeah, I think off-season grades are different than than season grades. I I look at a move like Rowdy Telez, and, and, you know, you and I have gotten into this. I think that wasn't good enough. I think that the Brewers didn't want him. And and they they went out and got Reese Hoskins. And I think that's an example of them not doing quite enough. I thought the the things got started well with the Marco Gonzalez – Martin Perez, I thought those were savvy moves, um, you know, hopefully eat some innings, but they they never really went beyond that for me, Jason. Right. And I think that's why I, would, I agree with you. I'd probably put it as C, C minus. I think D is a little bit harsh because I liked, you know, those moves early on. Um, and, and it just, it felt like there was some momentum there for a second. And then they just never picked up on it. Um, toward the starting pitching question, I, I did want to talk to you about a guy that a lot of people in Pirates Twitter specifically have talked about, Jordan Montgomery ends up signing a one-year $25 million deal with Arizona. Um, I think think a lot of people, Jason, are looking at it as you you signed Aroldis Chapman for $10 million in in a move that puzzled some people. Jordan Montgomery ends up being available on a one-year deal. And you and I talk about term all the time on this podcast, um, how the the Pirates don't like to give out a lot of term. Um, Maybe sometimes they'll spend a little bit more on the one year um, but they don't they don't give out term. This ended up being a, a deal without term. It's one year. How do you look at how how that shook out considering he was a decent player who fills their biggest need and yeah. I think would have done affordably if you maybe take the Aroldis Chapman money out of there? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think it's fair to say they should have done more with the starting rotation. I don't think it's reasonable to think that Jordan Montgomery would come here. 
Like, I just don't see how that deal makes sense. I, you know, I see why I, – I guess I shouldn't say it that way. I see why it makes sense. He's a good pitcher. He would help them, and they need pitching. But if you're Jordan Montgomery and you have $25 million sitting there from the Diamondbacks and $25 million sitting there from the Pirates, which one are you taking? 100 people out of 100 are going to take the Diamondbacks. So the Pirates then would have to overpay to get Montgomery. How are you going to overpay? Are you going to give multiple years, or are you going to give more over one year? To convince him otherwise in one year, what's that look like? $35 million for one pitcher? I don't know if that's the smartest use of funds. At that point, it goes to the next discussion with me saying, you're going to spend $35 million on one pitcher. Why don't you spend, you know, you could get three pitchers for that. And I think that's a smarter use of the money. And then you're going to say, okay, I'm going to go multiple years with Jordan Montgomery. I'm going to give him $26 million over two. That'll show him. I mean, Jordan Montgomery's a, a Scott Boris guy. I don't think he's going to hitch his wagon to the Pirates for any longer than he has to be. Like He's going to take $26 million to pitch for the Diamondbacks because he thinks it's a great prove-it year, and it's going to set up his next deal. So like, I don't, I don't understand why anybody would look at this and think Jordan Montgomery would even come to the Pirates. And, and for, from a Pirates perspective, I look at it like I could probably replicate that production for cheaper. If I'm going to spend $26 million on something, it's not going to be on one pitcher. Uh, maybe I'll spend 13 million on two guys. I don't know. No, they've done, they, they've spent no money. They've spent 10 and a half million dollars on a setup guy, which again, criticize away. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that the, the Jordan Montgomery specific argument or even Blake Snell, I just, I'd love to see him spend $26 million, just maybe not on one guy. Yeah. I mean, I think the Blake Snell deal was probably a little too rich for my blood, um, even though it, it came down quite a bit for, for what you'd expect for a guy like him. I, I look at the Montgomery situation more as um, I think if you were making this deal, if you were talking about it before you signed the Aroldis Chapman deal, you were anticipating that Jordan Montgomery was going to be completely priced out. Maybe, maybe you do do things differently, but I, I think the anticipation was that Jordan Montgomery was going to get more. I mean, do you do yeah. you agree with that, Jason? That that this deal is maybe being much more affordable and in line with what the Pirates could have done than maybe. But Adam, it's affordable when you're the Diamondbacks. It's affordable when you've got an exciting young team that just played in the World Series. When you're the Pirates and a bunch of questions swirl around whether you're good enough. I mean, why would a player with every option it's seeming if Jordan Montgomery was going to open himself up to a one-year deal for twenty-six million dollars, you don't think he's got like fifteen to twenty teams lining up, maybe more. For him, I mean, at that point, he's going to pick where he wants to play to a degree. I mean, not everybody's going to be there, but like to me, I think the pirate, but any deal like this, the pirates have to overpay because of what they are. And and you're going to overpay on a 25, 26 million dollar deal. I, I just don't know if that's the most efficient use of their limited resources, as much as I like Montgomery. I mean, I if, if the, the suggestion is uh, we'd like to have seen them spend, sp spread that across multiple players, I certainly don't disagree with that at all, Jason. I would just sit. I guess my counter to the um, the Arizona thing would be, I mean, aren't the Diamondbacks of last season what the Pirates aspire to be? Um, you know, a kind of yeah. a they're not going to be like a phenomenal team, but they're going to be in the mix, and and maybe if if things break right, they can end up in the World Series, just like the the Diamondbacks did last year. They were an eighty four win team. What you have for breakfast? Are you all right? <laughs> Well, they were an 84 win team that that when you end up in the postseason, it's it's. Oh, it's, I thought you were saying uh, the Pirates could wind up in the World Series. Oh, uh, we right. I mean, I think that they aspire to be the team that that does just enough to get there, and then maybe gets a chance to go on a run in the postseason where anything you know can happen, and the and the odds are much um, you know better for a team like the Pirates if you can get there. I, I think that'd be my counter argument would be. The Diamondbacks aren't too far off of, of what the Pirates – and they're not the most stable franchise in the world either, Jason. I think they had a, a rain out there the other day. Did you see that um, with, a, a what, an exhibition game, not quite spring training, yeah. where they, they can't close the roof out there anymore because the, the stadium's broken? I know they've been, they're trying to get out yeah. of that. Thing. Yeah, maybe that was done intentionally. They're trying to <laughs> sabotage poor Chase Field. I like Chase Field. Don't do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, I, I get what you're saying with the Diamondbacks. And, like, you know where my head goes with it? It's honestly to Paul Skeens. Because I hear you talk about the Diamondbacks and winning and what the Pirates want to do. I, I, I'm actually fine with it. At, at the same time, I can't get past the idea that Bailey Falter is their fifth starter. There, there is absolutely no way we can take you seriously and think you're going to be a contender when you're putting Bailey Falter out there as your fifth starter. If you're going to say, look, we're going with the kids. Jared Jones, he's been lights out. These are our three veterans. Be honest with you, it didn't quite pan out the way we would way we thought or anticipated this offseason. But you know, we got Paul Skeens, we got Jared Jones. We're gonna run these guys out there, and we think, you know, we're really excited about that. I 
why not, man? At this point, I mean, maybe that's what happens after you get past the 15 days or a little bit into May or something like that. I really hope so. But I, if you, you got to do something. You got to either lean on the young kids or go get veterans to to provide a stopgap. Like Bailey Falter is not the answer to, you know, getting in the playoffs and surprising people. Yeah, and I think that's the ultimate criticism of the offseason, Jason. It's not that, that we don't expect the Pirates to be better, I think. It's not that we don't. Um, think that they won't have exciting players, exciting moments. Um, it's that they told us they were pivoting to winning, right? And that's that's what the stated goal is. And yeah. I just feel like the actions don't quite align with what the stated vision is here and, and that that's, that's the criticism. It's not that this isn't going to get better, that's going to crest at a decent place. It's just that they're not acting like a team that's saying, yeah, we're going for it now. We're, we're, we want to be the Diamondbacks. We want to be a team that gives ourselves a chance to – to maybe go on a, a run in October and, and get to a World Series. They're behaving like a team that still looks like they're in a, some level of rebuilding. Mode. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I, but I, it is in select places, right? Like they, they've done things that do make sense. You know, if you're going to bolster the bullpen, like I don't have an issue with the Chapman signing. I just have a ch- an issue with the Chapman signing in the context of everything else. If you're going to say like, Look, we, we need to be really good in the bullpen and the way we're going to spend, like we can get more bang for our buck there. I completely agree. You want to you want to preserve every lead you have. And if you have five really good relievers, like, holy crap, can you do some things? And that that benefits them. I get that. Um, but, you know, and even the offense, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem this season. I, I really don't. I think they're at least middle third, maybe, you know, around the midway point of MLB. It just... And, I, you know, I wrote this in an analysis this piece this morning, Adam. Like, defensively, they should be pretty good. If you think about Triolo at second, Hayes at third, I mean, Rowdy Telez and Connor Joe, they haven't been abysmal at first. They should be good enough. It's not Carlos Santana gold glove level. Michael A. Taylor is the legitimate center fielder who's going to handle PNC Park very, very well. They should be a better defensive team. What I think gives everybody pause is just – the starting rotation, and you're not functioning like to your your exact point. You're not functioning like an organization that's prioritizing winning by running the rotation out there that they have. You mentioned Michael A. Taylor there, Jason. I want to get into Paul Skeens, Jared Jones here in a second because I think there's a lot of meat on that bone. But I, I don't think we got a chance to get your reaction to the Michael A. Taylor deal here on the podcast. I think yep. it, it came down right after we finished recording, um, what, 10 days ago. So can I just get your thoughts on that signing real quick? Oh, I love it, man. I love it. Um, you know, I think he's going to add enough with the bat. And, and honestly, like initially when this was floated early on, I kind of poo-pooed it. I, I didn't look enough into Michael A. Taylor and his defense and what he's done. Um, but after it happened, uh, you know, I'm I'm wrong or I didn't give it enough credit or whatever, you know, whatever crow I need to eat. The more I've read about this, the more I've learned about Taylor, talked to people about Taylor. I, I'm just I'm such a fan. I really am uh, at PNC Park. What it does to balance out their outfield, you know, him and Jack next to each other, left and center at PNC. I really like that. Probably limits a little bit on Reynolds. What he has to do, not a bad thing. I just, man, I, I just really, really like it. I, I like the bat. I like the speed. I like what he was. He, he went to a more power approach last year in Minnesota. I, I would expect him to kind of rein that in a little bit and try more of a contact thing, probably more suited to a skill set. But anyway, for four million bucks, Adam, I think it's money well spent. Yeah, four million bucks is almost nothing in this economy, as the as as the kids say. Uh, I think it has a chance to make the outfit better. And you, it's it's a signing that I have. You know, I I can go back fifteen years and say there's been a lot of times where I just wish the Pirates had another professional outfielder. Yeah. Um, not super flashy. You know, not not anything that you're going to say. Oh, this is a cornerstone of the franchise, but just a guy who's a professional, a solid hitter, a solid. I defender. mean, he's more than just a professional, though. To be fair, like look at some of his defensive metrics since he's been in the league, and I'm sure you have. Like, he is, <laughs> he's about as good as they get. Yeah, there. I mean, he's, he's a solid. I guess solid player might be the better way to say it. There's been a lot of times where you've had to squint to see it with someone, and I don't think you do with Michael A. Taylor. I think he. Um, just a good baseball player. And, and they, I've said this before, the Pirates just need more good baseball players, so I like that move a lot. Um, let's talk about Paul Skeens and Jared Jones um, because I think if you're just tuning in, if you weren't super tuned into to, to spring training, I think a natural question that a lot of people have is why Jared Jones and not Paul Skeens? Um, 
why why is Jared Jones also? I guess this is a second level question. Why is Jared Jones the guy they're burning the red shirt for? How many Pirates of, of the past have we had to wait until June to see? I mean, it's pretty much a lot of cornerstone guys. It's Andrew McCutcheon. It's Starling Marte. It's Gregory Polanco. All these, these big prospects that we've anticipated for long times. Jared Jones breaks that mold. Why does he do that? And why him um, and, and not Paul Skeens in this moment? All right. So I, I, I could talk for a long time on this. I'm going to try to be as concise as possible. I do think, and this is a little bit of a credit credit to the Pirates' new regime, that they do things differently than the old one with stuff like this. I, I don't think this is a move that Neil Huntington and company would have made with Jared Jones. Uh, he was rewarded for performance. He was their best pitcher this spring, and they're giving him a chance. Roster spot be damned, as they should. Why they're not doing it with Paul Skeens. This new regime also wants to do things on its own terms, what anybody else thinks be damned. And Sometimes that can be super too. It is ironic that all of a sudden last year, O'Neill Cruz was deemed ready in the middle of June. Um, you know, not after any particular hot streak. We, we've seen that. And, you know, part of me has that suspicion. I don't think they've disproven that criticism of them. Um, but as we separate Skeens and Jones, here's why they did Jones. It didn't do Skeens. Um, their biggest issue with Skeens is getting him used to a professional routine, or so they say pitching every fifth day in the pros as opposed to pitching once a week in college. Is that made up? I don't know. Um, I do know this, that Paul Skeens is an incredibly important part of the franchise, and you wouldn't want to rush anything. And I look at Scherzer, Verlander, Strasburg, Cole, there's a bunch of names there that all spent some time in the minors. So if I've got this piece that's really, really important, I'm probably going to tread cautiously. I don't want to take any risks. So I think that's what they're doing with Paul. If they keep him down for 15 days, they theoretically will preserve a year of club control. Now, I think that could vanish if he finishes in the top two of the rookie of the year voting, which you saw him pitch in spring, entirely possible. So that might be a meaningless discussion. But wanting him to acclimate or get used to something or feeling like, look, this cautious approach, and that's consistent with things they've done, say, with Rowanzi Contreras, good, bad, or indifferent. It's a characterization of this new regime. They want to be cautious with Paul. Jared Jones has done that stuff. He's been a pro for a couple of years, and he just pitched so well that they couldn't turn him away. So that's that's the difference. And I would hope that given what we're talking about and the need for starting pitching, that eventually they say, all right, Paul, you're good. We'll see you in Pittsburgh. He absolutely deserves it. Um, I don't know what he has to show, well, you know, what more he has to show them. Um, but Getting on that routine a little bit and slow playing it, I guess I get it as long as it doesn't take too long. What do you think the chances are that Paul Skeens throws like 200 innings though, Jason? Because that's that's partly no. how I look at it too. Is is that no. this is, this is some level of managing his workload and um, that that you know he's only going to get so many innings for the whole season. How many of them um, do you want to be in April versus September? Right, and and that's that's somewhat how I look at it. I you know I'm very much in the philosophical Paul Skeens should be here uh, camp in terms of just, I, I like signals, but I think this is a case where, um, you know, if he's only going to throw a certain number of innings, what, what, what benefit do you get of, of not, you know, kind of letting him figure things out in the minors a little bit, managing his workload and then getting him to a point where you can just say, all right, we're cutting you loose. Mm -hmm. You're going to go wild here. And, and so that we don't have to be talking about in September, are you going to have to shut this guy down? I mean, is, is that possibly an eye toward what they're doing here? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it, Adam. I do. And, I, you know, you had asked at the beginning, what are the chances he throws 200 innings? And I, I laughed and said none. Like, you know, he was at, what, one 120 some in college and, like, six as a pro. Like, I would be stunned if they went more of a 20-inning jump, especially after what happened with Johan Oviedo last year. Um, I, I, I know one does not necessarily correlate to the other but I don't think they're going to take any chances with Paul. So, okay, let's figure they're going to cap that at 150. And then you're saying you're going to, you know, not use too many of those bullets in Indianapolis, keep them for later in the, like, I, I think all of that's fine and fair, and which is why I've, I've said like mid May, something like that. But if you're Paul Skeens and you're going like shorter outings in Indianapolis, you're experiencing no trouble. You're just mowing dudes down. What, what are the pirates going to sit there and say? He's got to work on his changeup. He's got to work on his defense. He's got to work. I, 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 you can't even make up anything. Like it's very clear that this dude belongs here, and I understand. Again, I get the like every five day routine. But if you're going to tell me from 
mid-February to mid-May, that that isn't enough of an established routine that he can pitch every five days against major leaguers when he's just crushing minor leaguers. That logic makes no sense. So I agree with you. The innings and worrying about that, and he will be capped, and they will be conservative, and they're not going to blow it out, that's fine. But spend those innings in the most appropriate place, which is almost assuredly Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, Jason, and I think that it leads in well to my next question of of they're willing to make the uh, the throwing throwing guys that were former rotation guys that you know you would hope if they turn out uh, into being rotation guys um, that that's where they're going to spend most of their time. Um, Ronzi Contreras, Luis Ortiz, they're going to start in the bullpen. Um, is part of the the math with schemes here that you're going to give these guys a chance with these roster spots to show that maybe they deserve a little bit more, that, that they get another shot um, before you bring Paul. Because once Paul Skeens is here, like that spot's not going away, right, Jason? I mean, that's right. that's part of the rotation is his, unless he really struggles, which I don't think most of us anticipate he's going to do. So is this on some level giving these guys a, a final chance to to assert themselves? And if Bailey Falter falters, for lack of a better term, then maybe you're sliding in uh, yeah. a Contreras or an Ortiz um, type of situation? I don't know if I'd mix it all into one stew. Honestly, I mean, we we were talking earlier about the characterizations or, or stuff that this regime has done and, and clinging to roster spots is certainly one of them. So I think that's sort of the input with Falter, right? Like they're just not willing to let the roster spot go and we can look at it and we can hate it and we can disagree with it, whatever. But logically, he's out of options. They're probably going to give him a little bit, say like, OK, you've made these changes. You can kind of prove to us that you're anything. And then three weeks later, psh, we'll get ready if you don't do anything. Um, with Rowanzi, I think that's different. You know, it's just it wasn't working for him in the rotation. And you probably don't want to give up on the kid. He's been that fastball slider. The change up and curveball haven't been consistent enough. So, OK, maybe you put him in a relief role, see if there's anything there. I don't even know if I see him working back to the starting rotation. Priester didn't earn a job. He has options. Ortiz. I don't, I don't totally understand what they're doing with Ortiz. But anyway, like I feel like all of these guys have their own situation. And so does Paul. And I also agree with you that, like, when he comes up, he's not going back. But I, none of these guys matter even close to as much as Paul does in, in the bigger picture of this franchise. When you need to make the move with Paul, you bring him up. You bring him up and you DFA who you need to DFA. And what Luis Ortiz or Quinn Priester or Bailey Falter or Alonzi Contreras are doing probably isn't going to matter unless one of those guys is just really, really struggling. And that's why I'm, I'm making the move. I just... I guess I'm kind of agreeing with you, Adam. I'm just I'm just sort of talking a little bit more about those guys. I, I think there's more to be concerned with individually with them. I mean, I agree. You've got to make the decision of what you want to do with Paul Skeens first. I just wonder if they made that decision and worked backwards a little bit and said, hey, well, we've got these guys that we don't know what we have in them. we got a month, month and a half maybe where, where we have some spots on uh, this pitching staff that we can maybe figure these questions out before, you know, maybe their time is coming. Maybe those are the guys that get shipped out. Um, you know, I, I think it, it it works out for them in that way where you get a little bit of time to evaluate these guys before giving up on them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, at the same time, like, I just don't care. I, I don't care to find out what Bailey Falter has it if, if it's the coming at the expense of Paul Skeens. You know, I want to do what's best for Paul. And if what's best for Paul is to get on this routine and be cautious, you know, a little bit more cautious and not force feed him, and that takes me until May, fine. I don't love it. I'm more skew in what in, in your philosophical camp of like just keep, just get him up here. Come on, like I, I, we've seen enough here. And if you made me make a decision, that would be it. I'm just trying to understand both sides. Um, I just you know if you're it, it, it's just so silly. Do we really need to see any more of Bailey Falter? I've seen enough, man. I put these stats out here. 16 appearances, he's been scored upon in 14 of them. He's given up 16 home runs in 56 innings as a 56 and a third. As a pilot, like I, I, I've seen what I need to see here, and that I'd rather have somebody else in the starting rotation. I don't think the the question really needs to get much more complex. Yeah, that's fair. And I mean, you've been down there for a month and a half, Jason, and, and most of the rest of the, the the Pirates fan base has not been. So you have insight that that I think a lot of people lack. So I think it's valuable um, to hear that because I think you're you might be you, like you've seen enough of Bailey Falter because you've actually seen him, and, and I'll be curious to see what the reaction is. Um, from people as, as we go down 
um, toward the start of the season here. Um, Jason, toward that end, you've been down there. You've been watching prospects. Obviously, everyone's beating the door down for, for Paul Skeens. Were there any other prospects that caught your eye? And, and who do you think are, are the guys that, that we see first, maybe beyond Paul Skeens, um, mm -hmm. going into the season? You know, one of them was Jared Jones, and he stole my answer, jerk. Um, no, he's. I, I've had a high opinion of him for for years, and glad to see he did what he did. Um, you know, really, this, this is going to sound boring, but by the time I get to the end of it, it makes sense. Tamar Johnson. Um, I, I was asked a lot: Is Tamar going to see major league time? And I was like, he's a teenager. I really wouldn't put too much on him. Like, he's going to start at Double A. If he gets a Triple A, that's great. Man, is he not intimidated? Um, in a, in a beautiful way, like just a confident kid fits, not a jerk or acting like he's too good for anything or he has like anything. Oh, it's just like confidence that I didn't have at 19. I'm guessing you probably didn't have at 19. A lot of us didn't have at 19. Um, and so I'm really curious to see what he does in double a, his demeanor just impressed me so much. Um, uh, just so much more respect for him, getting to know him even more this spring. Um, trying to think of other guys that I really came away impressed with that we may see soon. I, I don't think so, Adam. I mean, you know, Salamedo is going to need some time. I like Salamedo, but he's going to need some time. Same thing with Bubba Chandler. They're the next two pitchers. Uh, I think Jackson Wolf will be up at some point, but he's still going to need a little bit of time. Um, position player wise, like I don't, you know, are, are we going to talk about Gorski, G1 Bay, Pagaro, Gonzalez? I don't think I saw anything out of them that I didn't already know. And, um, you know, younger group, I can't say anybody other than Tamar really separated themselves that much. As part of that conversation, just the kind of what you mentioned earlier, Jason, you like what the lineup has and its ability to, you know, be pretty solid here. Um, and, and that uh, it feels like for the first time, a lot of those positions are kind of pretty well locked down and, and that there's not a whole lot of room for a guy to, to kind of come up and break in. Yeah, and that's as it should be. I mean, I, I hope at one point they get to this and – and you're looking at the 40 man roster and be like, oh my gosh, who do they get? Who are they going to get rid of? This is going to be, this is catastrophic if they lose this guy. Like as of now, I can look at their 40 man roster and take a couple guys off, no problem. And they're going to have to by tomorrow. And that's fine. Um, which tells me there's just still not enough depth. And that's fine, I guess. Um, but you're you're continuing to build toward that. And and that's the way it should be, Adam. I mean, you should have good players in AAA who don't want to be there. And and you know, it's Miguel Perez's job to manage playing time and expectations or whatever, whether that's Bay, Pagaro, Gonzalez. By the way, I think it's going to be really interesting what happens with Bay. Maybe maybe nothing that we've talked about enough. Like they're keeping Alika Williams up with the big club, but G1 Bay helps them so much more in terms of an athlete who can go and do things late inning. Necess can't necessarily play shortstop, but he can play second. You can put Triolo over at shortstop if you want to do something like that in the later innings. Anyway, um, yes, it's it, it's getting much more competitive, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's part of the equation, too, that, you know, I think for the last few years, a lot of us have just kind of assumed that if there's a guy who's good enough, right, Jason, that they're going to be able to find a place for him. And I think to your point, that's still true to some extent. If someone's tearing the cover off the ball in AAA, they'll find a roster spot for him. It's just going to be not as easy to just say, oh, throw him out there. That guy stinks. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot fewer of those spots, at least offensively. I think in the pitching staff it might be a different story. Um sure. Jason, let's get into to some predictions here. Uh, Joe, you mentioned Joe Starkey's column earlier. He said 79 wins. Um, I'm going to go on record at, at 77. I think they hit the Vegas over, but I don't like them a whole lot more than that. Um, I, I think last time you were here, you said you think they can flirt with the 80s. Have you solidified that? Have you changed your mind on that? What's your final prediction here? I left my mind in Bradenton, I think. I'm going 83 wins. I'm going over 500, a little bit of flirting. They don't make the playoffs, but I'm saying 83 wins. I think what's that, 83 and 79, if I do math correctly? Not always. Doesn't always. Yeah, happen. yeah, something like that. Okay, so then where does that put them in the division in your mind? And and what teams do you put them ahead of right now with, with what you've seen? Yeah, um, they're going to be ahead of one. I think they finish in fourth. And I think the central, I think, is just going to be a mishmash of mediocre. I don't think anybody actually separates themselves, you know. The Cardinals, I like some of what they did this offseason, but like Sonny Gray's been banged up and isn't going to start the season with them. Um, you know, who knows what the Brewers have, if it's going to be enough. They they took on some water this offseason. I felt like um, don't necessarily know much about, you know, are the Cubs going to take any meaningful steps forward? So anyway, the team they're going to finish ahead of, 
I don't know. I'm going to go with the Cubs. There you have it, folks. Huge the, disappointment. The so what do you think the number that, that the division is won with, Jason? If the Pirates are at 83, are we talking about someone winning the division with 87, where this is, a, yeah. this is a race right to the very end between a bunch of teams? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be about 87 wins. 87, 88, somewhere in that range. It's not going to be pretty. I, I think you're going to be looking at <laughs> the first round of the play. You're going to see a lot of NL Central out and a lot of NL West and NL East advancing. But, yeah, I, I think maybe 88 wins. And where do you think 83 wins would put them in the uh, in the wild card race? Obviously, Arizona got in with 84, made the run to the World Series. That's the comparison we've we've kind of been making throughout this podcast. Yep. Um, does that get them anywhere close to the, this season? I mean, is it is it going to be more about can you win the division than a, than a wild card spot, or how are you yep. looking at, at how they they fit into the National League generally? I think they're actually going to be further out in the wild card because of the number of teams in the West and the East that are competitive. I just you're going to have the division winners there, and then the runoff taking up a lot of the wild card spots. I don't, I don't think that's going to be as competitive. Like, I don't even know if the division is going to feel super competitive because of how. I mean, I guess if you're saying they finish with 83 and the winner finishes with 88 by nature, that's going to feel competitive late in the season. Um, but I, I think you're going to look at, you know, at least I do. Like, I look at the Dodgers, the Padres, the Giants, the Diamondbacks out west. You know, you're looking at the Phillies, the Braves, theoretically the Mets, um, even the Marlins. Even I don't, I don't, I don't know if I put them in the category with those first three in the East, but I mean, you've got eight pretty, eight really good teams there for two spots. So I just, I don't know if I see the Pirates stacking up with the rest of that. I think the better chances for them to win the division. I just, I, I don't see them as being able to do that, do that at this point. What's interesting to me, Adam, though, is. You know, and like I think Paul Skeens will be up here in in somewhat short order, like in in May or something like that. You know, I think I've said around Memorial Day, and I still do believe that. What if they had a legitimate number five? You know, a, a legitimate starter here, and and you'd like to assume Mitch, Marco, Martin, Jones all work out, and then you add Skeens, and you have five starters, and and that's just heavenly. We all know that's not going to happen. So that's that's kind of what worries me is just that who goes down. There's no depth, right? Like, what, what, what's your depth at this point? Right? You're going to bring up Quinn Priester and pray. I mean, I, I like Quinn, but he had a six ERA in spring, and it just, I, I just don't feel as good about their depth as, as I would like to. And so, yeah, I, the starting pitching to me is what ultimately doesn't put them over the edge. Do you think the the to the to that point, uh, Jason? Of you think there's going to be a lot of competitive teams in the National League? Do you, do you think we end up in a scenario where maybe the, the Pirates underperform that win total you're mentioning a little bit, just because they play get a lot of games against those teams, yeah. don't maybe play a lot of games against some teams in the American League that maybe they'd be more competitive with? Yeah, I think that's a, a distinct possibility, Adam. I think writ large, the National League is going to be pretty good. I just don't think it's going to be in the Central. Um, so, I mean. I, I don't know how all of that math works. I mean, obviously you need to bake in what they're playing in the American league as well. Um, and you're going to get some teams, you know, that they're much more competitive against when you talk about Washington or Colorado, or, you know, I guess you could put more the Marlins in the category there. And I think they're, they're relatively close, relatively not, I'm not saying they're better than, or, you know, whatever with the central, like, I think they're somewhat on par. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're certainly going to get dinged up. Um, I think they they can and they have sneak sneak up on some people, right? Like the Dodgers aren't going to sneak up on anybody. The Giants aren't going to sneak up on anybody. Um, but the Pirates can. I think the Pirates can surprise some people, and they've generally punched above their weight. I don't know. I, I don't know where I fall in that discussion, Adam. If they've punched, like part of me feels like they have sort of maximized what they have on their roster, and then they've also done some really stupid stuff. So you would hope that they can, you know, kind of get some wins against better teams by sneaking up on them. Yeah, I think we saw a little bit of that last season, Jason, where where they played some some good teams pretty well, and then they had some frustrating losses against teams that weren't very good. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they can they can balance that out a little bit. I'll get you out here on out of here on this, Jason. Um, what are you most excited about that maybe we didn't get to in this podcast uh, storylines you're you're looking forward to seeing play out here over this first month? O'Neill Cruz, O'Neill Cruz, he's my number one. I wrote about this for our season preview. Um, I, I absolutely think he can be a star in Major League Baseball. I know that's not a hot take or a you know a, a big limb to walk out on or something like that, but um, you know what I've seen in spring, how he's carrying himself, 
the maturity I've seen in some of his at-bats. He ended spring kind of cold. But I, if he's healthy, man, and he's looked healthy, he's looked very good all spring, I just, I'm just i curious to see what, what the ceiling can be for him. I'm not sure we even know. He's just so, so physically gifted. And, you know, I think a lot of this should have happened last year, and I think a lot of this could have happened last year if not for that awkward slide and injury. We only got nine games of him. So to me, uh, the return of O'Neill Cruz, it's it's worth watching. You know, the same way we talk about Paul Skeens on the mound, it's O'Neill Cruz batting in at shortstop. Like, I just think there's so much potential there. I think he's going to start doing some outlandish, freakish things on a nightly basis. And the rest of baseball, I mean, they know about O'Neill, but I don't think they know about him to the extent that we do here in Pittsburgh. So I'm curious to see how that plays on a league level. What about you? Yeah, I think I think Cruz is, is the big story for me. And, and for me, it's about what does he do between those freakish events? I think we talked about this a little bit the last time you were on the podcast. Is is he going to be consistent enough for those numbers to pop off the page, right? And not just the the stack cast numbers where, you know, he hits a 130 mile an hour home run and it takes out a window across the Allegheny River. Um, you know, we know he can do that. It, it, can he do the little things that make you go from, from being a, a good player to a great player? Um, does he show signs of that consistency? That's what I'm looking at, Jason. It seems like you got belief that 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 we are going to see those things through him. I do, and I I saw them, and we've talked to O'Neill about them. I've talked to people close to O'Neill about them. How much he's put into plate discipline, staying off of pitches that he knows he can't drive, putting himself into advantageous counts, learning the value of having a plan and sticking to it and not going up there just looking to hit one in the Allegheny River saying, you know, if a guy throws me a breaking ball low and away, um, you know, in a, in a one Oh count, like, okay, you win. We're one, one, let's go back, you know, go back to the drawing board. And he did a lot of that. And if O'Neill Cruz is not like pitchers will attack him with breaking stuff. Right. And if he's leaving that and, and putting himself into hitters counts, I like my chances a lot with O'Neill Cruz at 2 0, 2 1, 3 0, 3 1. You know, and he's been getting fastballs that have been grooved and he's just been annihilating them. Like, that's not the sole strategy for O'Neill, but for him to not chase and for him to be much more disciplined at the plate, which again, he is aware he needs to do and he has shown he's able to do it. If you're doing that, man, I, I love it. Take your walks, get pitches you can drive, have a refined approach. The thing that worries me a little bit is his defense. It has not been great this spring. I'm just sort of extending some grace with what he's been away with, you know, with the, the ankle and, and timing and getting a feel and all that stuff. But, you know, objectively, it has not been good. And so I, how much do I care if he makes 35 errors? Not a ton. Not if he's going to provide the offense that he does. But I do think it's a, you know, just something to, to you know, that sort of goes into the discussion as well. Yeah, yeah, it was, and that was, I mean, it was part of the discussion before he got here, Jason, and, and it's always been a question with him, and I think maybe the injury kind of sent that to the back burner a little bit because now you're you're wondering what can he do offensively a little bit more. Um, so, you know, but I don't think that issue goes away, so certainly a lot to, to watch there. Jason, um, I want to congratulate you here before we sign off. This is, I think, is this your last official day as a Pirates beat reporter before you become a columnist for us here? <laughs> no. Well, thank you. Thank you for the congratulations. Um, no, I have, I, it's my last series. So I, we, we, the, the switch flips on April 1st, I'm told. Um, I guess some, some point when I fly back from Miami, I'll become a columnist, maybe over in North Carolina or something. Um, so I'm going to get back and I, I don't know, probably take a couple days, hopefully to just see my family and breathe for a little bit after spring training, but uh, later in the week for the home opener and stuff. Yes, that'll be, I'd say probably the home opener will be my first official voyage as a columnist. And uh, yeah, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah. I mean, you're not, we're, this is not by far the end of, of Jason's no. Pirate takes here on the, uh, the post because that's worse now YouTube channel. We're, we're working on some uh, ideas for, for getting Jason involved in all the other ways with Steelers, Penguins, yeah. And you have experience with those teams as well, Jason. I'm excited for your takes. Um, but just wanted to, to acknowledge here that, that it's been a lot of fun having you on uh, on these Pirates podcasts exclusively. It's been a lot of fun talking baseball with you. And, and I, I'm excited to see you in, in this new role. And I think a lot of people here are too. Well, we're going to do the same thing. Now it's just going to – the conversation is going to evolve. We're going to talk about Steelers. We're going to talk about Penguins, Pitt, Penn State, whatever. Um, 
yeah. And so Adam and I have been in discussions about how to make that work. I, I'm very confident that you will be stuck with me. Um, it'll just be in a different capacity. And then when you talk about pirates, you're going to deal with Noah and Andrew, and it's going to be delightful. I am so, so excited to see what those guys do too. I, I look at them as almost like my kids or something. They're just young journalists that I like so much and respect, and I can't wait to see them thrive. Yep, they're about to take on the marathon. I think the famous quote, Jason, is uh, by Bino Cook, the only thing tougher than covering baseball is covering a war. Um, but you come out the other side of that. And and, and uh, so I think it's yeah. something worth celebrating here for a minute. Yeah, no, it, 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 dude, I love it. I love it. I, I I asked to go to the Pirates. Like, I did not get in trouble. The Post-Gazette didn't want to screw with me. Like, I actively asked to leave the Penguins and go cover the Pirates. And I am glad every day that I did. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit apprehensive about leaving the Pirates. But it's also a job that I've dreamed about my entire life. It's time. It's the right situation. Um, so, we're going for it, um, but I love this beat. It's been really good to me. I've enjoyed talking pirates with you. I've enjoyed talking pirates with with you, meaning fans and readers and viewers. And man, I mean, you you see this stuff on on our side of the fence, Adam. But I am just continually amazed by the participation and viewership and reading and any way you want to describe it from pirates fans. Like this team has given its fans a lot of junk over the years and, and people just keep consuming it. They love it. It's a great baseball city. Our, our the, the, the numbers we get on our pirate stuff. I cannot thank you guys enough. It has made my job just so great and such an honor to do this stuff for you. I, I please beg of you to continue following our coverage. I know you will, cause it'll be good, but um, yeah, I, I don't even know where I was going with that. Just it, it's such a fun baseball city and it's been so cool to be a part, be in the middle of this. Yeah, well, we're going to stay in the middle of it. I'm excited, Jason, to, to see where we go from here. Um, so if, make sure you're signed up. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. So so whatever comes next, you're here for it. Um, if you like this video, please uh, like it. Hit the hit the thumbs up button. Help us out with the YouTube algorithm. Um, Jason, I'm not sure when we'll talk again, but I'm looking forward to talking soon. All right, buddy. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.